Welcome to the Center for Jewish History's Family History Today series of genealogy themed public programs. My name is Moria Meet, and I am the Center's Senior Genealogy Librarian. Thank you all for joining us today. And I want to give a special shout out to all members of the Israel Genealogy Research Association who are watching today. And a special thank you also to the Israel Genealogy Research Association for co sponsoring today's program. I just want to give you a little bit of background information about the Center for Jewish History before we continue with the program. The Center for Jewish History provides a collaborative home for five partner organizations that together form the largest archive on the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. In addition, the Center houses the Ackman and Ziff Family Genealogy Institute, which is where I am based. At the Institute, we strive to connect researchers to the wealth of genealogy resources at the Center and to make family history accessible to researchers of all ages, abilities, and levels of experience, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. While the center remains closed, our genealogy librarians are still working remotely and are eager to assist you with your research. You may continue to engage with us in the following ways. You may watch our weekly genealogy coffee break webinars for a brief dive into a specific topic in genealogy every Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time on the Center's Facebook page. You may email us at gi at cjh.org to ask for advice on your research questions or to arrange a free genealogy workshop for your synagogue, genealogical society, or other community group. And lastly, I hope you have the opportunity to see the announcements of some of our upcoming programs before I began speaking to learn about these and other future programs, please check out our program calendar at programs.cjh.org. A few technical notes before we get started. You may have noticed that your microphones have been muted and the chat box has been disabled. To send us your questions and comments, please use the Q&A box, which you should find on the bottom or right side of your screen. And please note that our speak guest speaker will be answering your questions during the dedicated Q&A period at the end of the presentation. I also want to note that this program is being recorded and will be available within the next month on our past programs archive at cjh.org, as well as on the Center for Jewish History's YouTube channel. And our speaker has also created an accompanying resource guide, which will be emailed to everyone tomorrow. With that, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Gary Regev, who has lived in Israel since 1978 and has been doing genealogical research for over 25 years. She has taught seminars, webinars, and courses in genealogy to a variety of adult groups. She is a founding member and the president of the Israel Genealogy Research Association, also known as IGRA. And in addition, she currently volunteers at the Genealogy Center at the National Library of Israel and at Central Zionist Archives. So with that, thank you so much for joining us today, Gary, and feel free to take it from here. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be here and the topic of research in Israel on the uh, evening following Yom Ha'atzma'ut is a very important um, theme and I'm glad that we're able to bring it together and it looks like there are a lot of familiar faces who are joining us and also many that I'm not familiar with at all. But we welcome you and I hope that you will get a better idea of the kinds of research that is possible and the ways that you can help to build out your family story for uh, incidents and people who pass through Israel. So my topic is the basics of research in Israel. And as Moria mentioned, I am the president of IGRA. And about 10 years ago, we sat around a table, actually my living room table, to try to figure out what we could do to make more records available in Israel, from Israel to the public. At that time, digitization was not even a thing in Israel. 
most of the archives had not begun any kind of digitization of their holdings. And those that did have some items digitized did not go ahead and then make a name index that would allow you to go ahead and actually search the data. With that in mind, we wanted to go ahead then and see how we could help people. Now, when we're talking about genealogy, we have all of the regular components of our information that we try to get as many pieces of this information to pull together a complete story about our relatives, our family. The expectations that we have when we're doing this research is that similar to what is available in America, you're going to be able to find a marriage license, the certificate, filled out with all of the information about the bride and the groom, the parents of the bride and the groom, the ages, where they lived, where they were married. We may find, want to find similar things to a census record that lists each of the family members clearly one after the other, whether it's a state census or a federal census giving information about where the parents were from, the ages, what kind of professions they had, or to get a death certificate for a loved one, giving the causes of the death, who was left, perhaps parents' names, other information about the individuals. However, the reality is a little bit different. The document on the left is actually from a ledger that shows baptisms. We're talking about Palestine. We're talking about the end of 1893, 1894. But certainly the names that are mentioned, Moses Landsman and Mordechai Marcus, these are Jewish people. And they were listed because there was a ledger in Jerusalem. And even though it did not have to do with baptisms, they have these, uh, we found that there were many Jewish people who were, were listed as well. They didn't convert to Christianity. It was mixed in. But there's little information. The other source of information are the Montefiore censuses. Now, this is again, for the Ottoman period, which is until 1917. Most of the records during the Ottoman period are not available in a language that's easily readable by any of us today. The old Turkish, uh, is, there aren't a lot of people who can read that anymore. We do have a lot of records that we are trying to get. And the type of record keeping was very different then. However, uh, Sir Monte Moses Montefiore asked to have several censuses done in the land of Israel and Palestine, 1839, 1849, 1855, 1866, and 1875. If by chance you have relatives who were in Israel at that time, this is a phenomenal resource to be able to look at. And some families that we know are able to actually see their family from one census to the next and see different changes that came about. Just as the American censuses, different questions were asked in each one. And the format is different as well. A group of volunteers from IGRA it began as volunteers from the Israel Genealogical Society and then moved over to IGRA, put together a translation of these Montefiore censuses. So the uh, results are available both in Hebrew and in English. And the 
Montefiore censuses are available. The index is available on the IGRA website. Once you find the, the name, there's a link that will take you directly to the image on the website of the Montefiore endowment. Once we get towards the mandate period, the kinds of records that are available are going to be different. Here we have a voter list from 1936 in Tel Aviv. We have the last name, first name, the first name of the father, whether it's male or female, the age, what group they belong to, whether they're Ashkenazic or Sephardic, and an address. So you do see some family groupings and there is some information. The list is in Hebrew. There's also the public notices that were put in the Palestine Gazette that told of name changes. And there's the old name with the last name and first name, the new name also, and the nationality where they had come from and where they were currently living. One thing that comes the closest to vital records that there are in Israel are these certificates of marriage that are from the British mandate time. These certificates are now at the Israel State Archives. They are not a complete listing of everyone who got married during that time period. However, it is a very large amount of certificates. We have here the information of the name of the groom and the bride, the parents, uh, where they are from, their ages, of course, professions, and then there are witnesses as well that are listed on the document. What IGRA has done has taken each of these and the basic information is available to you in both Hebrew and in English for people who are registered on our website, which you'll see a little bit later on how exactly to do that. You're able to see the general information and the kind of database, the name and the name of the parents for additional information about what is included and perhaps to be able to see a scan, you would need to be a member of IGRA. Going away from IGRA to my heritage, they have a collection of 206,000 naturalization applications during the mandatory Palestine time. These are multi-page documents. Sometimes they have the picture of the person involved and they also go ahead and give you a lot of the information translated into English so that you can see the information in Hebrew and in English. And you can go page by page if you happen to find one of your relative and get a lot of information about them. There are privacy laws. Since Israel respects the 70 years of confidentiality and vital records, as well as uh, ID numbers, there is not a lot of these kinds of records that are currently available. Being just 73 years old today, we have not released birth, marriage, or death certificates since Israel obtained statehood. So if we can't get the vital records, what are we going to do? Well, we look at other things as well that help us to fill out the picture. So what can we get from the statehood, time of statehood, we have a list of different professions, medical practitioners, candidates for Knesset, all kinds of, of um, jobs that people held, whether they be nurses or teachers or lots and lots of other professions. There's also a new listing of name changes. The name changes now have the uh, they're now in Hebrew. They were still in a public domain document that you can now go into any library and find them. So 
we don't have a problem in showing that information. So here we have uh, the last name and first name, the old one and the new one, and where they are currently living. Israel has a lot of archives. IGRA is uh, working together with over 30 archives. I think actually it's now getting closer to 50 archives. And I've divided them up into various groupings so you can see the kinds of information and the places that we can turn to to bring information about families to you and the general public. So there's, of course, the Israel State Archives, the Central Zionist Archives, the Central Archives for the History of the Jewish People. Each of the cities has a municipal archive. And here you can see the basics of what kind of information you may be able to find at some of the larger archives. So as I said, the state archives has done a lot of scanning and most of their scans are available on the website. Their search engine is not as easy to go through as one might hope. There are documents from the British mandate. They have countrywide voter lists. There's information about immigration and marriage. There are some Ottoman documents and some from the state of Israel. The English interface, as I said, is not as good as it could be because of the corona and a lot of other problems. The reading room at the State Archives is not currently accessible. The documents may be in Hebrew or English, depending on the time, certainly. They do have a, a way to write in and ask them to help with some of your questions. At the Central Zionist Archives, they do have a lot of things scanned now, but it's available on what's called an intranet, which is only within their building. Most of the records are in Hebrew, some are in English or other languages. They have a lot of voter lists. They have things about the cities, settlements pre-state, about immigration and illegal immigration, but they don't have a name index. Their English interface is currently very weak. They have promised a new website coming up. We'll see how that is. The reading room is not currently accessible, but when it is, you need to have Hebrew to be able to uh, deal with their computer system. And when they are answering research questions, they have a special form you can fill out. It takes a while and there is a fee, but the Central Zionist Archives is going under a um, time of, of redoing the physical archives, and they have moved to a temporary headquarter at the uh, Binyan Auma, and they are not able to have as many services to the public as they have had in the past. Their process of uh, reconstruction is going to take about two years. Municipal archives may have voter lists, school records, census records. Many of these are already available on the IGRA website with scans, although some of the records from Jerusalem specifically, the ones that are from the Sephardic community, we don't have the scans for those. Uh, where we have been asked to not show scans, we don't. The majority of the records in the various municipal archives are in Hebrew. The Central Archives of the History of the Jewish People. They're doing a lot of scanning now. This archives is going to be incorporated into the new National Library of Israel building, which we hope will, uh, in the next year or two, will finally be uh, changed, moved. It's across from the Israel Museum. And the archives will be then a part of the, the new building of the uh, National Library. They do have many, many unique records that come from small Jewish communities around the world. The records are kept in the vernacular. The search is by community and not by individuals. 
additional sources. Of course, there's Yad Vashem. There are some museums that deal with specific cultures and, and origins. There are other things that deal with the Shoah, with the Holocaust, Beit Lochomei Agetaot. There is Yad Ben Svi, the Jabotinsky Institute. Beit Tvutzot has changed its name. It's now Anu, the Museum of the Jewish People. There is the historical Jewish press, which we'll talk about in a moment, that is a part of the website of the National Library of Israel. Yad Vashem is a natural place to look for, for information about um, relatives who were in the Holocaust. In addition to the pages of testimony, they are adding in additional documents all the time. And you can possibly find several documents that deal with uh, relatives. There's also the Arlson collection. And the records could be in Hebrew, English, or uh, other languages of the countries that were involved. The historical Jewish press is not an archive as such, but it's an online collection of newspapers. Um, you could find information about births, weddings, uh, people who landed on a specific boat, accidents that happen, but newspapers in any genealogical research are very important. We also have the Facebook groups. There are now many, many Facebook groups that answer questions and deal with genealogy topics. And people who are researching in Israel have a lot of resources available to them through various Facebook groups. Philip Trowering has put together a compendium of Jewish genealogy. If you are not familiar with it, it's worthwhile going and searching through and finding what kinds of records might be available. It's a resource that will send you off into a lot of directions that you may not have thought of before. As far as the cemeteries, there are, of course, the cemetery websites. Sometimes they're only accessible in Hebrew. There are, of course, the uh, Billion Graves and Find a Grave alternatives. Billion Graves teamed up with MyHeritage and went all across Israel. And they, uh, with the app on telephones, went ahead and identified and uploaded to um, the internet, I would say about 95% of the tombstones that were there at that time. I don't know if they have gone back out to try to catch up with the people who have passed away since then. There's a, a um, specific pointer that will take you to that tombstone because they're all with geo points and you can find out exactly where the tombstones are within a cemetery. We'll go in and see some of the variations. There's a new one in Israel called Graves, which goes ahead and is documenting again a different in a different way some of the cemeteries in Israel. And there is the City of David which is the cemetery on Har Zetim, that is the Mount of Olives Cemetery, that will uh, be able to give you, hopefully, the uh, positions of graves for people who were buried on the Mount of Olives. The commercial websites that are important in your searches are My Heritage. Ancestry and Family Search. All of them have different collections and different kinds of records are available. If you look at their catalogs, you'll be able to see the kinds of records that they have that deal with Israel, the Middle East. Jewish Gen is important 
but it does not have a large collection on Israel. It's a good resource for cemeteries as far as Israel is concerned. And for they do have some other information, but in general, Jewish Gen has a wealth of information that any researcher of Jewish genealogy should be familiar with. We've just come out of Yom Zikaron, which in Israel, the fact of having Yom Zikaron and then immediately following having the Independence Day with a switch over with a service, a small a ceremony notice that that transfers from the day of remembering all of the soldiers who without them the state of Israel would not would not be what it is today. All those who have fallen, it's getting closer to 24,000 individuals who lost their lives in keeping the state of Israel. Each of the organizations has its own website. We have a little bit of the information, not all of it. Some of them like to keep the information on their own sites. Yizkol is the main site that holds a page for each of those who they have information for who have fallen. And you may be able to find a relative there. There's another one that's called Giving a Face to the Fallen. And that's an organization that has been working in the last few years to try to identify those who don't have family to go and be with them on the memorial days and to find a way to tell their story, where they were from, to find a picture of them, to try to give their lives a little more meaning. They've been doing an amazing job in, in the past few years. I was reading something today that showed that the soldiers today were sent out and each of them had the biography of a fallen soldier. And they were sent to be next to the grave of each of those and to be able to talk to the parents and relatives and to get to know that soldier more. And so that each soul, each grave had a soldier standing there to honor them. It's a unique country. There are two major genealogy societies in Israel. One is the Israel Genealogical Society and the other is IGRA. The Israel Genealogical Society mostly has their meetings and their information in Hebrew. The IGRA is more connected to a bilingual group of people and we try to be attentive to all. Outside of the state of Israel, we mentioned already the Montefiore Endowment with their the censuses. There's the National Archives in England, the JDC Archives that has a lot of information that you may be interested in. IGRA has several uh, databases that have been shared with them. The um, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Library of Congress Actually, IGRA has a representative of information from each of these, and I'm sure there's more information that we might be able to get from them. This is a search page for the Israel Genealogical Society, and most of their information, as I said, is in Hebrew. And now we've come to IGRA and how IGRA can help you move along your research. So for those who are not familiar with the website, we invite you to come. First time you come in, there's a register now button. We encourage you to register. Very little is available to those who are not registered on the website. Once you've 
filled in the registration form, you come back and put in your username and the password. The other thing on the home page to pay attention to is the menu bar at the top, which will give you information about what IGRA is, membership, access to our databases, the different media resources we have, and how to be in touch. Also on the left-hand side are all of the upcoming events. We have a lot of articles. Most are in English, some are in Hebrew. I just brought you a few so that you can see there are a wide variety of genealogy topics. Also in the media section, we have webinars, recorded uh, webinars, lectures that we have put up on our website on a lot of different topics. Again, some are in Hebrew and some are in English. Webinars that go up on our website, uh, the webinars themselves are free. Once the recording goes up on the website, it's available for two weeks to all who are registered and then they are available to those who are paying members of IGRA. We also have what's called a show and tell session. And those are shorter uh, lectures that deal with a specific topic. And um, we have those on Monday evenings. Again, they're Hebrew and English. And we have um, many different topics. These are available to everyone at any point. Anyone who's registered on the website, they're always available. In our resources section, because the society is based in Israel, we know that there are many, many people who are researching their family, but their family was not from Israel. So we do have resource guides for a lot of different parts of the world. And we invite you to come in and to see those and to use them to be able to find more information from those specific areas about how to do the research there. Among the resources that we have, aside from our databases, we have alphabet aids, a section about the Hebrot Kadisha, how to request official documents from the Ministry of Interior, um, an inventory of the Landsmannschaft material that's available at the Central Archives of the History of the Jewish People, some Mohel ledgers that we've been able to uh, acquire and, and use, Montefiore censuses, as I mentioned, things about graves in Israel, cemeteries, Yad Vashem resources, and here is our compilation of Israel resources. Before we get there, we have acronyms on tombstones, deciphering gravestones. A lot of these are uh, handouts that have come as a result of lectures that have been given. The resources are in alphabetical order. They go according to different sections. There's archives and libraries, museums, and more. On the handout that I gave you, I invited you to come and look through these yourselves instead of reinventing the wheel and putting it all on the, the um, handout that you have. So come back here and find in the resources there is a compilation of Israel resources. All of the blue highlighted ones are live links that invite you to go directly to that site. We tell you whether the site is in English or both English and Hebrew or only Hebrew. When you get to our databases, we like to point out that we are currently just shy of two, two million records. The last input of records was on the 4th of April. We're trying to add a few thousand more records each month. You'll notice that there are different descriptions of each of the four main periods, the Ottoman administration, British, the Israeli state, and miscellaneous. 
there are some tips about how to best get results. And we'll go through these other sections of the database page in the next few slides. If you put in a name and you have too many results, you'll want to make use of our filters. We have the filter of record types, ones that are connected with censuses and registries. We already have over 400,000. There's also donations, education, lots to do with elections, whether it's candidates or people who are able to vote, the Holocaust, immigration, the military name changes that we saw the earlier slides, um, different occupations, sports, and what we're able to bring as vital records. There's also a filter that deals with record repositories. If you know that a database came from a specific place, you can look for it. And a, um, the ability to look for records by individual databases. Now these numbers you're currently seeing are gray because this is just the entire amount of records that we have in our system. But once you put in a name, the um, categories will be fewer, only the ones that are actually appropriate for that name. And they'll show you the exact number of records for that name in that category. For instance, I put in the name Abraham Cohen. And this is the way it looks when you get the, the results. You can see, as I told you, that you have um, the name of the person. Now, I asked for Abraham Cohen in the uh, original resource here, the question. And they're giving me for Helene Cohen, but she's the daughter of Abraham. So we do have the Abraham and Cohen. So the results are not limited to it being the first name of the person in the um, listing that you have. So her, here we have a database that deals with births of the um, Sephardic gen. We have marriages and divorces from Sephardic gen, and we have the marriage and divorces of the Palestine British mandate, those uh, forms that I showed you earlier. You'll notice that some of these have a date alone, and some have a date with a page next to it, which means that you can actually see a scan. Okay, so there are different sections. There's a section of putting in the names that you're looking for. You don't need to put in both a first and the last name. You could use one or the other. You can also do it in Hebrew, and we have a virtual Hebrew uh, keyboard for anyone who doesn't have keyboard, uh, their own keyboard with Hebrew on it. Don't try all four at once, either Hebrew or English. Once you hit the search button, the request for the surname of Cohen with phonetic matches and the given name of Abraham pop over into this listing over here which will keep me up to date with what has been chosen. If you want to eliminate one of the search items, all you do is click on the red X and it will go away. If you want to add in more filters, you can go ahead. The listing is much longer. I'm only showing you a, a screenshot of what I can put on one, one screen. And there were 31 results. I'm only showing you the first small bunch of them. If you clicked on details, you would get this screen. You can't see the details for the record because you're not a dues paying member. But if you were a dues paying member, you would see that the information is both in Hebrew and English, most of it. The certificates, I didn't mention before, sometimes the wedding certificates are handwritten, sometimes they're in uh, typed. You can share the record 
in a variety of, of ways. And you should read the information about where the documents come from and when they were put up on our website. Sometimes when it says more information can be found at this link, it will not take you to the item itself, but it will just give you a more uh, description of, of what the record set is. Now, what do you do if there are Hebrew words and you need it to be translated? So again, we have, for instance, occupations, and we have uh, some other things that are in Hebrew that you might not know what it is. So you can copy and paste the information, highlighting using control C to be able to copy it, go to your browser, open up Google Translate, put in the cursor and then control V. That will give you the translation of the uh, what you were not able to understand. As far as cemeteries are concerned, some of the cemeteries, IGRA has the um, ability to show you the tombstone itself, some of the information we've been able to give you in English. This particular tombstone, you can see the complete tombstone on our site. Now the writing on the tombstone is all in Hebrew, but if I go back to the what was written here, the date of death is written out for you in English. Now here's another example. And this one, when you read at the bottom, it tells you that you can find information by clicking on the link. This is from Haifa. We have some of the information in English, but we don't have the ability to show the scan itself. When you go to the follow the link, it takes you to the Billion Graves website where you get the information about the person and you can click again and see the tombstone itself. There's this new thing called graves. You can also put in the name in Hebrew or in English and it will take you to the cemetery and get you to the tombstone itself. They don't have a lot of cemeteries that they've done yet, but they are working on it and uh, adding in more as time goes by. At the bottom of each page of results, you'll see that there are additional places where you might be able to find information. You can click on them. Logan Kleinwax has a resource of the genealogy indexer and whatever results are available on his site we show at the bottom of the page, some of them are phone directories and there are others as well. So again, we're back to the home page of IGRA. We have the membership section. Oh, when you go in and register, the next thing you'll see is a little green button that will say you can join IGRA. So if you click there, or if you go into the membership heading and go to join IGRA now, it'll pull up the ability to pay for membership. Membership year is not a rolling year. It begins in January, goes through December. Um, the membership is 150 shekels or $45 for a calendar year. And it's not PayPal. The PayPal is the interface. You can choose to use PayPal or a um, credit card if you choose to support us and to become a member. The um, advantages of being a member, you are able to see scans, you get the webinars and uh, articles, and you're part of a really cool genealogy society. We do a lot of good things. We do a lot of uh, volunteering and outreach 
And we'd love to have you be a part of us and help us to bring more records to everyone who is researching in Israel. Again, we try to find records in as many of these categories as is possible to pull together as much information and fill out the story of our relatives and be able to show the kinds of things that they did, what they were involved in when they were in Israel and perhaps where they came from, information about their parents and to complete the picture of our family story. I'm ready for questions and you can write to us at webmastergenealogy.org.il and visit our website. Thank you so much, Gary. That was, that was wonderful. We do have a number of questions from our audience, so I'm ready to get started whenever you are. Okay, so I'm gonna start with some questions that are specifically about the IGRA website and its databases. So sort of a general question. Um, you mentioned early on that some of the documents that people can find on IGRA's website or through IGRA's databases are not viewable on the website. So how would somebody go, if they find something of interest uh, that is in that category, how would they go about obtaining that document? Well, it's kind of complicated. The um, documents that come from Sephardic Gen, which we now, uh, Jeff Malka was able to, to allow IGRA to show their, their databases and the indexes of their names and, and all the information, but their whole database set didn't have scans. Mm. So we don't have any of the scans that back up those documents. The um, documents of the Sephardic community in Jerusalem, we do have a lot of, of uh, marriage registers and some specific censuses, but those were never scanned. And they're in the original, very old Hebrew, and uh, they're difficult to read. And I don't believe that you can get copies of those. Okay. Uh, some of the information from uh, collections like Chaim Sidor uh, of Tzfat and some of the other things are just not available as, as far as scans that we can get, although we are working on getting the cemetery at Tzfat, the images. Um, the communities like Zichron Yaakov and some other cities have allowed us to index their material, but not to put up the scans. And so we have to go with what they are requesting. You would then have to turn to that archive specifically and ask them, tell them, you know, also the Central Zionist archives does not let us put up scans. So you would have to go to them and ask them specifically, you know that this document exists for a specific name and can they please get it for you and give you a copy. Okay, thank you. Next question is uh, more about search strategies. What would you suggest, how would you suggest somebody search IGRA's database if they don't know the exact spelling of a person's name? Is there a more flexible search option for names? search engine that we have is based on phonetic searches. And so you can put in the name in a variety of spellings yourself and see what different solutions the database pulls up. They won't be identical. You're welcome to search it in as many different ways as you can think of. It's good to search both in Hebrew and in English because you can get different um, results from each of those. Uh, and you can try it as an exact spelling or as a phonetic spelling, and it will give you a whole variety of, of different spellings that you can, probably some you didn't even think of yet. We go with 
whatever the document said. So if it's an English speaking document and it came with, you know, just like the, the names at Ellis Island or the, when the census taker came around, they were very creative with how they wrote the names. So you may not find the name and exactly the spelling that you think your name should be, but that doesn't mean it's not your name. So be open-minded, try as many different options as you can and um, see if the rest of it fits in with the picture that you're, you're hoping for. Yeah, I would agree. How much of, of an overlap is there in the records that are available on IGRA versus MyHeritage? MyHeritage has an index of what's on IGRA. <laughs> um, the um, databases that we have the ability to share, we've also put the index of the of the information on MyHeritage and then people are told that they if they want to see more they can come to the IGRA website. Uh, uh, okay. We suggest that you know the not everybody is familiar with IGRA and, and we wanted to make sure that people who are doing research, they may not even know they had relatives in Israel. So we're happy to have the index of our, our data for the databases that we can share uh, available so that people can see them on MyHeritage as well. But the, the, um, the same record will have, um, it, certainly if there's a scan, it will be only available on the IGRA site and not on the MyHeritage site. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so now we're moving on to more general how-to questions. Let's see. Do you th feel that it's appropriate to contact an Israeli cemetery and ask them if they can photograph a grave? Is that something that's commonly done? Not so much. Okay. Uh, first of all, as I said, Billion Graves has 95% of the, the tombstones that are, are already on their website. You can search it either through Billion Graves or through MyHeritage. MyHeritage has, uh, I believe, almost all of those that have been, have been uh, the pictures have been taken and they've, they've gone through already and transcribed all of the, uh, the tombstones. The advantage to searching for it on MyHeritage is that it'll pull up the name in English or in Hebrew because they also uh, do a bilingual thing uh, mm -hmm. or in Russian, whatever language that the tombstone is in. Uh, the Billion Graves it's a little more challenging to be able to get to it, but they, they do have all of the information there as well. So that would, that's, that, that's where you would recommend that people go rather than the writing. The cemeteries don't really have offices. There's the okay. Hebra Kedisha and they may or may not be available to, to go out. I would, as a as a, a first thing, I would try to go and and uh, and see if it's available on my heritage. Certainly, if there are older graves, uh, they're much more likely to be able to find it. And you can always put up a request, both on Billion Graves, my heritage, on IGRA's website, to ask if there's somebody who can, uh, and Facebook, to be yes. able to go out and to. Uh, to find a specific thing if you know exactly where it is. Yes, there are a lot of volunteers out there. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I had a number of questions about um, where to find records of Americans visiting Israel. One specifically asked about during the British mandate period. Um, and, the, and another one about the, uh, you know, early statehood period when, uh, like the 1950s. As far as the early statehood, I don't remember seeing anything. I do know that at the Israel State Archives, there are some uh, database uh, files of things that we've made into databases that deal with uh, Americans who 
were here in in uh, Israel, and um, I haven't found a lot of them. What about like the, um, ship or airplane arrival lists? Is there anything like that? No. Okay. No. The um, ship lists during the mandate period are not very organized. We're trying to pull them together, um, especially for the period of illegal immigration. But the um, we have not found manifests of ships that came in once the statehood was declared. OK. Uh, let's see. Um, so you talked about the name change lists that are available. Um, do, is there also a place to find name changes that are due to marriage? Would, would those no. be, would those be included within the, no, right? No, no. Okay. These those would not be included within and wanted to make their name into a Hebrew name to shorten it to whatever the, their um, official name changes that's not to deal with marriages. Okay. Um, how, uh, aside from the um, sort of scattering of vital records that are available online, uh, how would someone go about obtaining vital records from before 1948? Okay, so the Ministry of Interior has very strict guidelines for who is able to even make a request to get information. There are, uh, um, just like there are the marriage certificates, there are also death certificates that are at the Israel State Archives, and we're trying to obtain the ability to get those and to make them available as well. Uh, but through the Ministry of Interior, you have to be able to show that you're a direct descendant of, and you have to also know their ID number, and you have to know when, what year, at least what year they died and what year they were born in order for them to be able to even evaluate whether they can give you an answer. There's a form that you can get to it's one of the resources on the website that you can find exactly where that form is and how to fill it out and make a request, mostly through the um, consulates or embassies that you have in the States, which are not open right now. Uh, let's see. Okay, so someone asks about British mandate period naturalization applications. You talked about one specific set that covers 1937 to 1947. Are there any sources for people who uh, naturalized, became naturalized citizens earlier? No. No, okay. Not that we're aware of. The, the um, Israel State Archives is the one holding those and from what we understand, that is the record set. If they find more, then uh, my heritage will get those as well, and they will be able to um, make them available. Okay, oh, this is an interesting question. Do you have any suggestions on locating death notices or obituaries in Israel? The historical newspapers the Jewish Historical Press, which is on the website of the National Library of Israel, is the main one for um, the past. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, there are newspapers like the Jerusalem Post and Palestine Post that will be in English and there are others that are uh, in Hebrew, but you might be able to uh, locate them and, and have the ability to translate it. And there are, 
people at the National Library are also very helpful with, with genealogy questions. What about going more recently in time? Um, are there, for example, newspapers available from the last few decades? There are some archives of newspapers. The library also has, uh, like the Jerusalem Post, the main, the main newspapers, I'm sure they have the archives of those available for the last several years. And I don't know exactly the dates that, that they have digitized, but uh, it could be possible to, oh, it, the uh, obituaries are few and You might be able to find some. <laughs> and there's death help. notices are, are less, they're more for people who are uh, important people, who people who, uh, the country is so small, everyone's important. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. There are, uh, oh, this is an interesting question. In Israeli cemeteries, does the proximity of graves indicate that the, um, potentially that they are close family members, or are graves of family of within a family tend to be more spread out? That depends a lot. When your um, loved ones pass away, if you haven't already arranged for a plot at the cemetery. Uh, you're given a plot and it may be already in between two people. You may then decide that, or it, you may get to, um, to the cemetery and find that you can actually purchase the plot next to it and save it for the next person when their time comes. Or you can decide in many cases today to have one tombstone for two so that you're um, in a uh, uh, double housing. And uh, <laughs> the, um, there are a lot of different options, but, but a lot of people will go ahead and do that and purchase the second plot if that is an option in that particular cemetery. Okay. But, doesn't necessarily depends on how full the cemetery already is. Um, any specific recommendations for finding records from uh, significantly earlier time periods, like before, you know, before the um, 1880s, let's say, like in the earlier 1800s? Very few records exist. Don't forget that when the, the Turks were ruling the country, they had a totally different record keeping system and different things were important to them than what we may consider to be important as far as record keeping. And um, due to the changes in everything that, that happened between going from the, the Turks to the British and then from the British to statehood. And a lot of things either just didn't exist to begin with, were lost or something happened to them along the way, or they're in a condition that is uh, very difficult to be able to understand and make use of it today but very little exists. We've done our best to find whatever early records there are, and there are some, but you'll find most of them already in the databases on, on the Eagle website. You can look through the section on the, the database homepage that tells you about the different uh, uh, administrations. You'll see during the Ottoman time period, when you open that up, it gives you a list of the beginning databases that we put in. We haven't continued to fill that out and show you all of the databases, but you'll see the kinds of, of databases that are available and that we have found so far. Uh, it's, it's not a, a complete listing of, of what we have, but it's at least a start and will give you an idea. 
but to also see the numbers of, of how many uh, listings there are for each of those, that, that they're not huge databases. There, there really is, unfortunately, not a lot of information in, in many cases where we would have hoped that there would be lots more. But again, the main source before 1880 is Montefiore. If you had people who were in Israel in 1875, that's your main key. Okay, um, let's see. There are a lot of questions about immigration records. Um, there are some, they're not in the best um, there's, shape. There's a, a, a set of them at the Central Zionist Archives and there's a set at the, at the Israel State Archives. We're doing our best to uh, make them available. It, it's coming down the, uh, down the pike. Okay. And we're happy to have you volunteer to help us <laughs> to make more databases available. And how would somebody, uh, reach they out? Should write to us at the, at the webmaster genealogy.org.il. We'll be happy to, uh, to help you get into the volunteering mode. <laughs> Um, let's see. For the records of immigration that do exist, um, would, um, would people have had to, uh, meant to, um, uh, fill out their parents' names? The list that I've seen Mm -hmm. does not have a lot of that information on it. It has their names, where they came from, and when they arrived. But they're not the forms like you saw with the naturalizations. Mm -hmm. It's just a listing of who came in on any specific day. Okay. Um, and if it has a form, name of a parent, it would only be the father's name. Oh, this also. is a good, good question. Are there Lonsmanschaften in Israeli cemeteries? In the Israeli cemeteries, there might be. Again, there's a list of, um, of the Lonsmanschaft that are, well, that's at the Central um, Archives of the History of the Jewish People of, of different Lonsmanschaft. But um, the person who is the best one to know about Landsmannschaft in Israel is uh, Avram Kraus. But if you write to us uh, at uh, our webmaster address, uh, I can try to help you more specifically with that information. Okay. And are there record collections from Landsmannschaft that are stored at the Central Archives? No. No. Uh, not really. They they each had offices, and they're very very um, protective of their information. And the a lot of the information that they have is um, letters that were written back and forth, and not documents of uh, of people with any specific details. Okay. A lot of communication. Uh, are there any lists of people in the Ma'abarot? That's part of, well, the, the Ma'abarot in Israel, when people came in during the illegal immigration period and they went to um, Atlit and mm -hmm. they, or they were sent over to Cyprus or to um, uh, Mauritius, then there are those lists as part of the illegal immigration collection. And if it's not on our website now, it will be the information about people who, who uh, were there. There's also the athlete website uh, that I didn't put up, but they, they also have uh, records of people who came during the illegal immigration period and their stories. And um, there are more records 
about that time period at the Central Zionist Archives. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, someone asked. Uh, someone asked a question specifically about Anu, or formerly known as Beta Tutot. In your opinion, do they have any unique information that is of of genealogical value? I'm going to be politically correct. <laughs> um, Beta Tutsot has a few things. One is a history of certain names, which is nothing that is unique in itself. You can find that information in other places as well. They do have some information about communities. Again, that information can be found in other places. They have some family trees and they have a new format for their family trees search that I was trying out the other day. And the you may be able to find some of your family. They if you they're dependent on people specifically donating trees to them. They don't tell you who the trees are from. They'll tell you the number of the tree. Mm -hmm. They will tell you the year of birth and death if the person has passed away. Otherwise, there's a name of a person. They don't tell you uh, if they're alive. And in that family tree, they don't give you any additional information to that. In short, right now, there's not a lot. They do have a picture uh, database and a music database. Okay. I think we can wrap up now. So before we do, can you please share how people can get in touch with you? I don't know if you want to share the screen again or um sure okay and is there anything else you want our audience to know about igra we're happy to have people join and help and we need people who are able to work with databases who can help with some programming videos uh, social media and other than that we like to have you write articles give us suggestions for webinars information that would be helpful for you to know the archives in Israel are trying they're working to become more modern and to be more open to people from outside of Israel it's a long road and now they've taken three giant steps back because of Corona. We hope that things will open up again. And we are definitely available for questions. There's a Facebook page, Twitter, and we are happy to have anything that we can help you with that we're, we're happy to do so. Well, thank you so much, Gary. Um, I really appreciated all of your illustrations and talking about how to get around, you know, certain obstacles and uh, where there, you know, where there are certain gaps in, in records where you can find other records that may shed light on your family. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. And thank you for all, to all of you out there watching and we hope that you will visit us uh, when we reopen and continue to to um, participate in our programs. Okay, have a good day, everyone. Thank you and so much. Bye.